I want to start with a little story, which is when the Arden Threes were first released, I was asked to be on Night Waves, which was a Radio 4 program. I don't think it is still on. And Lisa Jardine invited me to be on with a number of people to speak about the Ardens. And she said, it'll be a wonderful opportunity to puff the new edition, and it should be quite a lot of fun. So I said, indeed, it sounded like fun. And we arrived, a number of people, into the studio. And Lisa began introducing the people at the table and said, this is Professor David Castan, one of the general editors of the Arden. So, David, let me ask you a question. I was looking at this edition, and it seems to me, she paused and said, remarkably dull. <laughs> I was taken aback. Um, she said, yes, well, there are so many commentary notes. And I started to say something, and Declan Donnellan, who's a wonderful theater director, leapt in at that moment, saving me from embarrassment, and said, oh, Lisa, you're, you're wrong. The notes are the best thing about the additions. I bought Declan dinner for the next five weeks, um, having been saved from the humili humiliation of that moment. But it did make me think a lot about what the notes were for. And it's clearly for Declan, the Arden notes are what makes the edition unique, the, the fullness of them, the fact that the kinds of things an actor needs to think about, uh, a teacher needs to think about, a reader needs to think about are there. And what I love about the notes is, in fact, their fullness. But having said that, the fullness may be a negative as well. They may be distracting, they may be intimidating, and I do think there are probably readers who look at that page and feel somewhat put off about the ratio, by the ratio of note to text there. But having worked on them, I, I guess I came to feel that, uh, certainly as an editor, they were really, in, in a way, the most wonderful part of this. I came to think of the notes as a, as, as a cocktail party rather than uh, you know, a, a, a overwhelming feast. I think some, you come home from a feast and you're too full and not only bloated, but probably don't remember everything that went on that evening. But a well-run cocktail party with a brilliant host or hostess who makes quick, agile introductions and keeps conversations going, that seems to me what's happening in those notes. It's a, it's a way for readers to get engaged with that play that might seem in various ways intimidating in itself, but suddenly it's available. You know what conversations can, can take place. The notes are this wonderful way of clarifying what individual words mean or may mean, what phrases mean, echoes of those phrases in other works by Shakespeare and other works by other writers thinking about the way that the theatrical history clarifies the action that is sketched out in the language on the play and on the page. And it always just seems to me that what the notes do are make this play, which to be realistic about it, is often more difficult than we admit, uh, often in a classroom. I think we sometimes underestimate to our students how hard the language is, how difficult it is to visualize the action on stage. And the notes become a way of, of, of making it accessible. They're not trying to close down the interpretation. They rarely say, this is what something means. But these are the ways in which it might mean something. These are the, the ways in which you might enter into this language, enter into this play. And it always seems to me, both as a reader of these uh, and as an editor having written my own, it, in so many ways, the most remarkable part of this whole process, when you realize that really since the early 18th century, this process of editing Shakespeare and trying to make it accessible and clear has been going on, and you just take your place in this cocktail party in a kind of wonderful, exciting, and you know, actually truly enjoyable way.